Good morning or afternoon to you. Thank you for joining today's webcast. I'm Jan Reichert, Executive Director of the Antibody Society. I'll be moderator, and this is the first in a series of webinars designed to inform and educate our members, as well as the broader scientific community, about topics relating to the adaptive immune receptor repertoire. The Antibody Society is very pleased to include a group that works actively in this area. They comprise the adaptive immune receptor repertoire community, also called the AIR community or AIR-C. Our speaker is a very active and longstanding member of the AIR community. Professor Victor Greif from the University of Oslo will discuss steps in data processing and analysis of adaptive immune receptor repertoires, best practices, pitfalls, and future directions. Please note this webcast is being recorded. We'll take questions at two points in this two hour webcast, about 55 minutes into the presentation and then in the last five minutes. Please add any and all questions to the Q&A box in the viewer. We may not get to all of the questions, but Professor Greif has kindly offered to create a Q&A document after the webcast. A link to the document will be sent to all attendees. Without further ado, I turn the show over to Professor Greif. Thanks so much, Jan, for the introduction. <clears throat> and hello, everyone all over the world. My name is Victor Greif, as was just introduced, and I'm the head of the Lab for Computational and Systems Immunology at the University of Oslo. And this is today an AIR Community and TABS webinar on AIR data analysis. So a brief um, disclaimer <clears throat> is that this webinar is meant just as a brief overview of the adaptive immune receptor um, field, short air. So if you want to know more about any of those points that I mentioned, uh, please consult the cited um, citations that I put on each slide. I may go quite fast because we have to go a lot through because the airfield is quite large, but I put a lot of um, citations on every slide, so it should be quite easy to um, read further in all dimensions. And um, also, if you're not following me on Twitter, uh, please do so. Um, so I will give a brief introduction to the adaptive immune system, which is, um, as opposed to the innate immune system, um, the part of the immune system that records each immune event over um, our lifetime. So when Whenever we encounter bacteria, viruses, cancer, or any of these kind of things, um, immune information about um, these events is recorded in our immune memory, which you see on the right. And these are um, our B and T cells, which have um, B and T cell receptors or together called adaptive immune receptors. And together they form uh, our immune memory kind of like an USB stick, which I'm showing there. So uh, we can think of uh, T cell and B cell receptors as natural diagnostics and therapeutics. So they record past and current immune status. Um, they are very important for um, vaccine success. So not only antibodies, but also T cell receptors as has been shown more and more now. And of course, um, from the from the pharma point of view, um, monoclonal antibodies, T cells and CAR T cells have become blockbuster drugs over the last years and decades. So we can use the um, natural sensing ability of T cell and B cell receptors for um, diagnostics and therapeutics research. And I guess for all of you who are in this field, you're either working on understanding the immune system from a diagnostic point of view or from a therapeutics point of view. One complicating factor about the adaptive immune receptor repertoire is that the, the um, diversity is huge, um, larger than 10 to the 13. Um, we have recently summarized key advances and challenges of immune receptor analysis. And um, over the last decade, so since immune receptor research has started um, 10 years ago, a bit more, um, there has been a lot of progress on each of those um, major um, blocks, which are genomics, uh, going to proteomics, computational immunology, biotechnology. Uh, so we, we can now high throughput sequence, 
immunoceptive repertoires, we can look at the serum antibody repertoire, we can um, to a certain extent, to a certain extent um, predict um, antigen binding. And uh, we have also established uh, to some extent CRISPR-Cas immune cell editing. However, major challenges still lie ahead, such as ultra high throughput antigen specific uh, sequencing um, from um, an experimental point of view or from a computational point of view, uh, predicting um, antibody antigen binding with very high accuracy. And I will touch on some of these points that I mentioned here throughout my presentation. Um, so this is the outline of the webinar, um, and after the a second um, topic, we will make a short break where we can answer questions for five minutes. And as was just said, um, uh, if we don't get to all the questions, we will answer them in writing after the webinar. Um, so adapt. So antibody and T cell diversity is generated via VDJ recombination. This is one of the fundamental mechanisms then that one should know if one is deciding to start in this field or if one is working in this field. And what is happening here is that um, 1V, 1D and 1J gene usually are recombining to form the variable domain. And this is true for both B, B cells and T cells. And um, uh, this is one way of diversifying immune receptors or for getting this high diversity. Um, B cells have one further dimension with this, which is somatic hypermutation. Um, although there are some eLife papers, I think, which have also shown somatic hypermutation in T cells in sharks. But in humans, um, the hypermutation part is, um, uh, uh, is a B cell specific. Um, so if we zoom in further into uh, the variable region, we have framework regions and we have complementarity determining regions. And especially the complementarity determining regions 3 or CDR3 is, has been shown to be most important for antigen binding. And uh, all the CDRs are um, usually mutational hotspots. The framework regions are usually less mutated and are more important for the structural stability of the antibody. Um, I'm putting also two references there at the bottom, which have recently shown for T cells that um, a lot of the times for the uh, beta chain, there seems to be not a D gene involved in the, or D segment involved in the recombination. And also for B cells, it has been recently shown by uh, Jana Safonova and Genome Research that there can also be VDDJ recombination. So, and um, uh, yeah, so it seems like anything is possible in adaptive immunity. Um, if we zoom in on the right side of the slide on the uh, immune receptor repertoire, uh, we can zoom in on the antigen specific repertoires and there one of the outstanding questions is what is the diversity um, of, um, uh, so how many receptors we have for a given antigen or even a given epitope. I think for some antigens we might know this a tiny bit, but overall this is a very unresolved question and we also do not know how the um, motifs look like that predict antigen binding. And we will touch upon all of these things again in the next slides. One thing that I also want to stress is that many people in the B cell receptor field um, mostly work on B cell receptor sequencing, so on the DNA or RNA level, whereas there's also uh, the antibody side, so the proteomic side, the, uh, because antibodies are um, proteins, right? So, and in order to um, get to the sequence diversity of the um, circulating um, gut or serum antibody repertoire, people have used proteomics. And this is also still um, an up and coming field, I would say. So there haven't been a lot of papers on that that actually marry the um, genomic side and the, and the proteomic side of the um, immunoglobulin repertoire analysis. So this is just a side um, comment. So, um, but we will mostly focus on immune Receptor sequencing, here you see the general workflow. You um, start from a model organism, you um, 
isolate your um, cells of interest, you perform library preparation and then um, pre-processing and then statistical analysis with regard to the research question that you have. Um, the good thing about AirSeq, which is, which is also a short for adaptive immune receptor repertoire sequencing or high throughput sequencing of adaptive immune receptor repertoires, um, allows us so to look at the central principles of adaptive immunity. So we can follow um, cells over time as they um, mature uh, through B cell ontogeny. And we can also look at um, on the right hand side, clonal architecture, conversion selection, lineage dynamics and evolution and clonal expansion. So all of these things can be computationally looked at um, if we um, analyze immune, when we analyze immune receptor um, data. So um, many of us might not have the um, means or, uh, or or sometimes do not want to generate their own data. So there are many, so and there are many um, public databases that have a lot of um, sequenced immune receptor uh, receptors. On the left side, you see antigen specific databases. Um, some focus only on T cells, some focus only on B cells, some have epitope. Um, information, some do not, um, some only have COVID information, for example, so um, all the citations you see on the left. On the right hand side, you see citations for um, uh, for databases which have a more broad scope, which um, a repertoire scope where um, you, have, you can find billions of um, uh, sequenced receptors and also entire data sets. So you can then go there, re-analyze these data sets or take these data sets to uh, supplement your own um, data sets for um, validation purposes, for example. So that's very nice. And here, I'm not going to go into detail, but this is from a paper from Mike Shugai, where he um, outlines what you can do with antigen-specific um, data on the T-cell side here. So for example, you can look at the antigen exposure imprint, immunogenicity prediction, tumor-specific TCR prediction, and so on and so forth. And it's all very well explained in this um, review paper. <clears throat> So something that I think is also very important to know is where do you go if you have questions? Because when you start, you probably have a lot of questions and reading reviews is sometimes not enough. So we recently opened a Slack channel. There's also uh, the BTCR forum, which is um, used a lot. Um, also, if you want to post uh, positions, for example. And um, then we have also many videos on our YouTube uh, page. And um, we also retweet a lot of um, the air papers coming out from, from our Twitter profile. Also, please follow um, the at air community uh, profile if you are not doing that already. And please also subscribe to our YouTube channel. And please also um, uh, subscribe to our Slack. Um, yes, so this uh, was just an introduction that um, saying that um, we can now investigate adaptive immune receptor repertoires at, at, um, at high throughput. It can be performed at the genomic or proteomic level for, for, for B cells. And we can resolve um, the central principles of adaptive immunity. And there is already a lot of public data out there um, for um, starting your own analysis journey. So now we come to the um, second topic. And after the second topic, as I said, there will be um, a five minute or so Q&A. Um, so we will talk about um, air uh, correction and standardization of um, um, air seek data. And um, if you focus on the left side of the slide, um, Adaptive immune receptor data, there's, so there are many pitfalls and many um, directions you can go. So it goes from deciding on what cells you want to isolate, how, um, what, um, if you want to focus on DNA or RNA, how you want to uh, perform the library preparation, um, how to perform data preprocessing and how to perform data analysis. And each of those things can add variability to your analysis. 
that's why it's good to always um, uh, try to be reproducible to the extent possible. So um, the AIR community has been working a lot on standardization of immune receptor data um, generation and also analysis and also uh, deposition of data. So here are some papers. So, and this is mainly uh, work done by the working groups, um, which either uh, focus on, depending on their purpose, on um, uh, standardizing um, data formats, um, software, or even experimental standards, such as spike and standards, for example, which is um, still in the works. Um, so if we look at, um, uh, so if we start our journey now, so from the, from the cell uh, point of view, so from the cell isolation, you, um, this is just to show you that um, the adaptive immune um, cell um, diversity can be subdivided into many different ontogenetic stages, both on the T cell side and the B cell side. And um, your data will depend uh, on what, or your conclusions will depend um, on what cells you um, uh, take out and what cells you try to look at. Most of the studies only look at uh, PBMC, so a mixture of many of these cell types. And sometimes then it's very difficult to then pinpoint to one uh, specific cell type then for a specific phenomenon. So it's mostly a good idea to focus on specific cell types, and um, but that of course depends on the research question. Of course, focusing on specific cell types also makes your analysis much more expensive and much more um, high dimensional. Another, um, uh, if we focus on the right side of the slide, um, another uh, way um, to look at the data is either from the DNA or RNA side. Um, one thing, for example, to consider for um, if you work on uh, the DNA for B cells, it is then not possible to look at isotype from the sequencing point of view. Of course, you could have um, sorted before based on isotype, but you cannot resolve the isotype via sequencing because of um, the splicing from uh, going from DNA to RNA. So all of these small things are important to um, uh, take into account. Also, for example, plasma cells have more RNA than uh, naive B cells. So if you mix them together, the plasma cells might um, be overrepresented in your um, data set. So all of these small things one should think about. A very contentious topic in the AIR community is how to define clones and what is a clone. So I will not um, add to the controversy here. I will just tell you uh, what people have been working on. And I think an excellent um, review on this topic has been uh, written by Uri Hirschberg, uh, which uh, the reference is, is on the left. So if you want to read more, have a look at that. But basically what, um, uh, what uh, how people do, so um, this is mostly done for B cells because they hypermutate and you want to group those sequences together that come from the same uh, naive B cell. And all of the subsequent um, cells that um, come from this naive B cell, we call them clonal lineage. You can, and then you can, you can group those uh, sequences together, for example, by using uh, sequence uh, distance cutoffs, which you see on the upper right, based on some hemming distance. Before, it's usual to group your um, sequences by same V and J, and sometimes also same CDR3 length. Uh, recently, there have been um, published more sophisticated approaches, mainly by the um, Kleinstein lab, where they uh, use some kind of clustering to find um, a good uh, cutoff for um, for deciding which sequences um, uh, group together in a clonotype and not. And also, um, they have been also KMER based approaches also by the Kleinstein lab for uh, building um, clonal families. So all of these things should be taken into account as well. And there is no right or wrong answer. Um, but um, if you want to be, if you are, if you want to make big claims on somatic hypermutation or clonal expansion for B cells, it might be a good idea to look into these, um, how to assign 
chronotypes. And um, this, I think, is a good way to start uh, by looking at the slide and what people have published. Another very important thing that um, is um, also a very important topic for the airfield is sampling. Um, as you know, the diversity of the immunoceptor repertoire, even within within one person is so huge that it's almost impossible to sample completely in your data analysis. And you can, uh, you can see um, that by, for example, biological sampling, where you just, for example, take two different blood draws. And on the upper right, you see the clonal overlap of two different blood draws um, based on TCR sequencing. And you see that um, it's not a lot. And if you would, if you were to look at biological replicates also nowadays, even with higher sequencing depth, you would be surprised at how low the clonal overlap could be. So this is something to take into account. And I think it's a bit unclear how to resolve this variability in our data because of course sequencing takes a lot of money. So making all of these um, replicates without a clear way of how to use them in your data analysis is a bit tricky and there is no real approach for that yet in my opinion. Then there's also technical replicates which look at um, which technically is resequencing of a library or also um, um, uh, splitting at the PCR step and then doing um, things separately. And even there you would be surprised how um, high or low the overlap can be. So if you have never looked at this or done this, I highly encourage you to do this just so you see how reliable <clears throat> or not immune receptor sequencing is. Um, yes, and you can look at the um, how good your sampling coverage is by using these species accumulation curves where you look at the um, percentage of reads and, and, and then how many um, clonotypes you have covered um, by sampling those reads. And most of the time, um, your curve will not look like this, but mostly probably, um, uh, you can see my cursor, so it will not level off. It will be probably in the middle of the curve. And this means yet that you have undersampled your data. But uh, probably close to 99% of all studies have undersampled your data, their data, so you would be just one plus one in the club. And um, you see even um, from this nature paper from, from uh, 2019, where they really over sequence a lot, you see that there is not really a leveling off of those um, accumulation curves. What is very easy to get is what you see on the right is a high correlation between the replicates um, of the V gene frequency. So that's very easy to get. What is very hard to get is high clonal overlap between the replicates. So that would look probably much worse if one would look at this, at these data, which is not a reproach for this data, it's just how sequencing works. And um, this has been also shown very early on um, by um, showing that um, you can find the, um, the deeper you sequence, the more public clones, the more shared clones you find. So um, saying again, also um, more sequences is always better. So because I asked a lot, how much do we have to sequence? The more, the better. And it's always good to know the number of cells you put into your reaction and then it's a good estimate to over sequence by five to 10 times of the number of cells. So if you have 1 million cells, it's good to have 10 million reads, for example. Um, yes, uh, this is from a very old paper of us where we showed um, how one could establish um, reliably detected clones and uh, I will not go into detail, but the more important thing is seen on the right, where we show that um, even if you get high clonal overlap in, um, uh, between replicates, um, getting correct clonal ranking, so meaning that you want clone one in sample one being also clone one in sample two based on read frequency, um, requires even further sequencing reads. 
showing again how difficult it is um, to get really high reliability of your data. And this we have shown here, and this has also been shown by um, Rachel Bedford Rogers also in 2015, um, also in BMC Immunology, where she also shows that, um, uh, so this is plot L here, um, where that um, accurate clonal ranking really requires a high, high sequencing depth. And you see that it gets, that the ranking gets better as, as she increases the number of sequencing reads, um, but uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it really requires a lot of reads. Yes, what uh, this is also one of the few papers um, where uh, people looked at um, uh, the the overlap of DNA sequence um, sequencing and RNA sequencing, and here they found very high overlap or um, correlation. Um, but there are very few people that, uh, papers that have looked into this, so uh, in my opinion. So this would be something I think for further studies would be very nice to look into because it's quite an old paper and now we have um, uh, new technologies and new ways of uh, looking at the data. New pre-processing suits also that are much more sensitive now. A very nice paper also coming again to um, how data can vary across different sequencing methods have been has been recently published um, in Nature Biotech in 2020. And um, here I think the main takeaway again was there was variability across different approaches. And the variability was then decreased or increased by using UMIs. So you unique molecular identifiers or not. I will go a bit further into detail on the next slides on this. And um, I think a clear, um, a clear um, conclusion of what sequencing protocol to use um, for TCR sequencing in this case could also not been given because it really depends on your um, research question. So we now come to the UMIs, which is also a very contentious topic in the AIR community. So I will also not um, light more fire here or put more salt into the um, wound. But the main idea of, um, of uh, unique molecular identifiers is that you want to kind of um, get rid of sequencing and PCR errors, which can happen a lot and which can also bias your data into one direction or the other. So how this works is um, shown on the upper panel is um, you tag, so you put a sequence tag on uh, the cDNA, for example, and um, then in the data analysis step, you look, all, you, you look at all the sequencing um, tags or UMIs that tag the same cDNA, and then you um, merge them together, building a consensus read, it's what it's called. And of course, you can only build consensus reads um, if you have more than uh, three, for example, um, uh, UMIs per transcript, uh, which, as you can imagine, my uh, usual sentence now will further um, amplify the need for even higher sequencing depth. So what this, um, so here, this was a paper by the um, SciReady lab where they looked at um, how data looks before UMI correction, where you see that um, one clone, which was a spike in, where you knew the sequence, um, the exact sequence, so here called Christina W, um, which had uh, 24 false clones and then was then corrected to one clone thanks to um, the UMI correction to the consensus read um, building. <clears throat> the, um, we have also used UMIs in a completely different setting, not for error correction, but also but for checking contamination. So a lot of the repertoire field is is, um, is focused on uh, looking at um, and looking at um, public clones, so the overlap across different individuals. 
and um, sometimes it's not clear if it's if if something is contamination or not. And so people usually use for um, clonal overlap either um, uh, either the CDR3 or the entire VDJ sequence, which so. And the CDR3 is usually a barcode, but um, the UMI is also a barcode. So what we did here is um, we used um, we used UMIs to check for contamination. And how do we did this? So we so we looked at the CDR3 overlap on the bottom left um, across different samples, and um, then we checked whether any of the overlapping CDR3s also had the same UMI, which would be highly unlikely, um, um, uh, uh, which, which should not happen if you don't have contamination and which would happen if you have contamination. So CDR3 that are overlapping and also have the same UMI are most likely contamination. And here we could exclude the contamination, for example. So we, I haven't seen so many papers using that approach, but I think it's a very nice way of using UMIs. Yes. The problem, so now this was now the good side of UMIs, now we come to the bad side of UMIs. The bad side with UMIs is of course also that you can, that you have a lot of, that you can have different errors also in the UMIs, just as you have for the sequencing reads. So you can have sequencing error there as well. But the most important um, problem with undersampling um, and UMIs is um, is that you have to have at least uh, three UMIs per transcript to build the consensus re um, read, and that means you have to oversequence a lot. You see this, for example, here in this 2013 paper, where where uh, most of um, the reads um, had had only one UMI. So I'm talking about the upper left plot now. Um, and oh, and then so maybe 20% of the reads had um, uh, were in groups that had three or more. UMIs, which means that most of the data here could not be used for UMI correction. We have also seen this in, in our data where um, we, I show here again the CDR3 overlap on the right, where the expected overlap, if we do not um, uh, correct for UMI, is about 14%. And if we use UMIs, it goes to 0.23% because we have to throw away so many reads because we cannot use them for consensus read building. And the same has also been um, put into words um, in the Nature Biotech um, paper, which I'm quoting on the upper, uh, on the lower left, where um, it stated, yes, UMI-based methods can be more accurate, but, um, but they decrease the observed TCR diversity. So I think a takeaway for UMI is if you have a very low sequence diversity, um, then UMI is good. If you want to look at the diversity of an entire repertoire, then you would have to oversequence so much that it's economically almost not feasible at this stage. Um, yes, so this is something really to keep in mind. What also is to keep in mind um, for any annotation, and I think this problem has not been solved so far, is that the D region annotation is quite unreliable. And that's why most of the time the D region is not even um, shown in any annotation um, plots, for example. So people mostly show only the V and J, and then you see sometimes um, a blank for the D. That does not mean that, the, that there was no D in the recombination event, could have been, but the more likely um, thing is that it was just not found because the D just gets chopped up uh, too much um, uh, during BDJ recombination. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, on the other hand, V and J assignment is usually um, higher than 99% accuracy for most of the tools. So that's not something that one should worry about. Alleles is something different, which I'm coming to now, is 
Um, so germline gene alleles is um, something that has uh, come up recently and um, which is uh, mostly um, a topic for the B cell receptor side. Although I think people are also now working on this for T cell receptors. So what is happening here is that for, if we just go to the upper um, left of the slide, is that um, many, uh, so before we had high throughput sequencing, um, most of the, um, it was thought that there is one gene and maybe a few alleles. With high throughput sequencing and new technologies, we now know that um, we probably all differ um, by maybe one or two or several um, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Why is it important? Because um, if you don't, so if you, for example, look at somatic hypermutation, um, somatic hypermutation it takes only into, so the assigning of the mutation count takes, um, is always with respect to a reference germline gene data set. Um, if you don't take, take into account these polymorphisms, then your, um, for example, your um, mutation count might, might be off, or even your clonal family assignment might be off also. So um, that's something to uh, keep in mind. What is interesting to note is that there are many um, um, uh, initiatives now to look at um, polymorphisms, both from the air community side and also from the research side. So um, there are databases where you can uh, look at um, uh, the recent um, uh, alleles that have been verified so, so that you can use them in your um, assignment, in your clonal assignment, in your VDJ assignment. And there are also um, um, uh, computational suits, so um, approaches that can infer um, alleles from high throughput sequencing data. Some of them are, for example, IG Discover, which I'm uh, quoting on the upper, uh, um, on the lower right. So just go to these um, citations and you will see um, many com computational approaches that can um, infer novel alleles and or also haplotypes. So why is it important that we look at alleles? Because um, um, they are not only there for our amusement, they are also they also have been implicated into disease. So for example, um, alleles of IGHV169 have been implicated into better or worse um, neutralization of the virus. Um, and also these also may vary by ethnicity as many of the polymorphisms are. They could vary by ethnicity, but we still lack really um, large scale data to uh, pinpoint this. And they have also been um, uh, uh, attributed to epitope specific antibody responses uh, in autoimmunity. Um, alleles have also been, so I'm not showing this here, I'm just saying it, have also been um, um, implicated in the response to malaria and also have been uh, recently um, looked at for uh, vaccine responses. So some alleles um, are, are more or less good in um, generating in for a precursor B cell receptors um, for, for then generating broadly neutralizing antibodies. So this is just to say um, that if you're not really interested in somatic hypermutation and super correct clonal family assignment, um, polymorphisms is still a bit of a niche thing, but I think it's getting more and more um, um, interesting and we find more and more of them. And hopefully with more large scale data sets, we can actually link them to disease and also antigen binding. 
and then it will be soon very important to um, build for each individual that um, you look at also its own reference data set so that your somatic hypermutation count and your clonal family assignment is correct. As I said, for T cells, um, I don't think there are so many reports if any, um, but um, but I think many groups are working on this as well. So I would be surprised if we um, do not see a very high diversity on the TCR side as well. Yes, and I think I'm a bit faster than I should be, so we have then more time for question, I think. Um, so just to summarize again, um, Biologically, so this is, I think, a very important point. Biologically conclusive AirSeq really depends on deep coverage of immune repertoires. And I have been working in a lot of collaborations um, over the years where people thought they had deep, that, that they had sequenced deep enough and um, for, for example, UMI correction. And in the end, we could not use the UMIs because they did not sequence deep enough. So if you want to use UMIs, for example, you really need to over-sequence um, uh, 10 times more than you think you have already, at least. <clears throat> um, and coverage um, might be assessed via replicates or, for example, species accumulation curves. I don't see so many people doing replicates, but even if you don't need them for your analysis, I would encourage you to do at least once do them and see how bad things can really look. Um, then it's very important to keep in mind that AirSeq library preparation can induce numerous errors, such as, for example, uh, primer bias, um, PCR bias. Uh, primer bias could be, for example, excluded if you use um, uh, primer-free approaches, such as race. But race might have other biases, so there's always a pro and con for everything, unfortunately. Um, I would also like to say that um, computational error correction is possible using uh, the mixer annotation suit, for example. It would be very interesting, I think. I haven't seen a report where they looked at mixer error correction and UMI error correction. I would like to see that, how good they are in conjunction or separately. Um, yes, so this is, uh, and then um, exactly, so UMI um, correction seems like a good idea on paper, but um, might be not, uh, might not be applicable for highly diverse um, samples where you just um, would have to oversequence so much that uh, you would not be able to afford it. <clears throat> um, so this is something really to keep in mind. So um, uh, because um, some groups might just use UMIs because they think it's the right approach and then they trim down that data set so much that they can almost not make a biological conclusion anymore because they have lost all the diversity of the data. Um, there exist numerous annotation tools, but um, care should be taken when choosing the, the reference genome, especially when you look at somatic hyper mutations um, with regard to the polymorphisms. And as I said, I think a very hot topic in the future will be um, finding more about the functional significance the diversity um, of uh, uh, polymorphisms and alleles in adaptive immunity and how they vary across ethnicities um, and how they're implicated in disease and how we can use them also to make better vaccines, for example. Um, yes, and I think with that, I'm, I'm at um, the junction where we can take questions. Um, so let's see if there are any questions. Yes, we have quite a few actually. So <laughs> let's, uh, <laughs> oh my, <sorry>. let's, <laughs> let's start you off and uh, get uh, these questions answered. Uh, so first one, 
Sometimes multiple B genes are identified in B cells upon sequencing a cultured B cell line. Is that a technical mistake or is it normal? Whew, that's, that's a good question. Um, so in one B cell line, there should be, I think, only one, um, one V gene, if I'm not mistaken. So that would be a technical error, I would think. Yeah. Next question. Is the clonal overlap small also after the immune system has been challenged, such yeah. as in vaccination or chronic inflammation? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a very good question. So I didn't show, um, so if you, for example, look at my cell reports paper in 2017, there you see that uh, the naive B cell overlap is 14%, and depending on the antigen, it, it can go to 30%, but it can also just go to 14%. So it depends on the antigen, it can go up and down. We do not really understand how clonal overlap relates to um, um, antigen diversity, I would say. I think that's an open problem, but um, clonal overlap can usually increase if you challenge and if you look at the right um, subset. Yes. Next question. Thank you for the response first. Next question. <laughs> uh, what is the best method to completely avoid next generation sequencing mistakes in the sequencing of massive repertoires? A little mm -hmm. bit more to that question. Hold on. Strict forward reverse merging of completely overlapping reads, massive oversampling, and throwing away all those with low N. Yeah. Um, well, these are very good questions. Um, I think you can never really avoid um, uh, any errors, but uh, I think you're right, Christian, that um, when you, um, uh, so in order to minimize um, error over sequencing is one of the best approaches so that you can be very liberal in um, throwing away the low quality reads. And what we usually also do is we throw away all the singletons um, we, uh, just to be uh, super strict. And this will not hurt you uh, so much if you have over sequenced, for example. Yeah. And um, of course, UMIs can help if you have over sequenced a lot. Yeah. And then maybe coupling this also to computational error correction using Mixer, for example, or MyXCR. Some people pronounce it either way, yeah. Thanks very much. Next question. What seek depth is recommended yeah. if using UMI? Yeah, uh, so many <laughs> difficult questions, which I try to not uh, go into because it will, um, results, some responses from uh, different people. But <clears throat> um, so as I said, if you know the cell number um, mm. without UMI, you should over sequence 10 times more. So then you would already have, so for 1 million cells, you should, um, so let's say naive B cells, you should over sequence but with 10 million. So you should have 10 million reads. With UMI, I would say at least 10 times more. So you would already be for one, 1 million cell B cell sample at B at 100 million reads, but just to be sure, one should probably go to 200 million or 300 million reads, which as you see, um, becomes just impossible. But uh, yeah, so at least 10 times more um, than the cell over sequencing. Yeah, yeah. So at least, uh, so if you go from the cell, really um, an order like 100 um, order of magnitude times more. Reads. Yeah. In a similar line, what are the reasons for under under sampling? Well, of this is because, yeah. So this is because of the um, high diversity of UMIs, and and the high diversity um, of of the transcripts, and you just need and then the um, and then you that you don't give enough sequencing reads um, to your samples so that you can find back. All the UMIs that you have at, that you used for the tagging, so it's mostly people being um, a bit too stingy with their um, giving reads to one sample, and that you can talk to your sequencing facility about. You can quite finely calibrate 
nowadays how many sequencing reads you give to a certain sample. And that's how you can um, get rid of the uh, UMI problem. Yeah. Thank you. A lot of work has been done with custom programs because few software programs are air compliant. In this case, what do you recommend for code sharing and reproducibility? How much should we openly share? <clears throat> How much should we openly share? I think, um, so in terms of uh, uh, software, it was the question? So yes. It was a question, yeah. Um, I think um, it's good to be as open as possible with software, um, especially since it will allow other people to find errors um, in, uh, in the code base. And because I think the adaptive, Adaptive immunoceptors are so complex that uh, no one software is good from the start and many software packages that are used by the community um, over the past years have become better with community input and we can only give input when something is open, right? Yeah. Thank you. Next question. What is the importance of the sequencing length except from the sequencing depth in BCR analysis also? which tool would you recommend for the VDJ alignment? Yeah. Um, so uh, the importance of sequencing lengths depends on um, uh, how much you want to, how much of your um, at, um, amplicum you want to cover. So for example, um, for T cells, since we don't have isotypes there and we don't have hypermutation, one can usually go quite short if your primers are, for example, in the framework three region, and then you just cover the CDR3 diversity, I think then you're fine and you reasonably well can still infer um, uh, V genes. Whereas, for example, for B cell receptors, one doesn't only want to cover most of the time um, the whole VDJ sequence, but also um, the isotype. And then um, the uh, two times 300 kit for, um, for Milumina um, uh, becomes uh, quite nice to have, yeah. But, uh, but this also depends on where your primers start um, uh, in your strategy. Uh, yeah, I think that's, and uh, which tool you would recommend. So um, I think most of the uh, tools that were um, uh, uh, suggested here in the question are for single cell sequencing. Those are very good suggestions that you give. Um, for um, single or bulk sequencing, you can also use um, MyXCR, uh, for example. Yeah. Next question. If the absence of clonal overlap is a sequencing-based issue, is there a reliable machine learning model to solve this issue? Ah, these are questions, unbelievable. Um, Yes, uh, no. So the answer is I, I don't. Um, so I, I will go a bit into detail in the next part of the talk where I talk about uh, machine learning and that machine learning can be on the subsequence level or on the sequence level. So to some degree, that's why people look a lot at um, subsequences, so KMERS, because that allows to um, circumvent the overlap problem. So that could be one avenue. Um, but um, uh, absence of clonal overlap, if it's if there should be biological overlap. So if the biological system lets you expect clonal overlap, then machine learning cannot change the biology, right? But it can help to encode, it can help encode data in a different way that circumvents these things. And I will also talk about the diversity uh, diversity profiles that will also um, circumvent lack of clonal overlap. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. What overlap percentage should we expect between mice in the case of antigen specific B cells? Yes. So there are not so many um, uh, mouse papers, especially for B cells. Um, there are many more uh, human papers and then also many more T cell papers. So in the airfield, people like T cells more than B cells, I think sometimes. Um, but um, 
if you go to my paper, there is um, one of the figures where we show the clonal overlap between mice and we went quite deep. So we had 1 million naive B cells and then we saw 14% uh, sharing between any pairwise mouse. Um, and, and for the, um, and for the antigen specific sharing, then we had three different antigens. It could have, it, it sometimes went up to 30%, uh, but uh, varied between, I don't know, 20 and 30%. So it can go quite high. Yeah. I think we have time for a couple of more questions. Can you comment on V gene polymorphisms in mice? Oh my God, these are amazing questions. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so um, the difficulty, so ideally, polymorphisms for one strain should not be there because, right? So the one, that's why we use mice because they should all be as similar as possible. That's why we use mice. Um, however, uh, people have shown that across strains, um, so for example, bulb C and um, black six mice, they can have, they can use quite different um, B genes. And for example, the very classic immune response to NP, um, is only seen in the black six system, but not in the bulb C system, for example. However, if you go again to our cell reports to 2017 paper, we looked at naive B cell CDR3 overlap between different mouse strains and found that although the V gene repertoire between these strains is different, the CDR3s were quite similar, which is surprising. But we didn't, um, uh, we didn't unfortunately look at different antigen specific responses in the different strains, which would be a very nice thing to do. Somebody should do this. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. You're doing very well with all these tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a special distance matrix for Hamming distance calculation for BCRs? Because mutations that appear due to hypermutation seem to be biased. <clears throat> Yes. Um, so I'm not a super expert on um, I, I will on the phylogenetics and the clonotyping. So I'm not completely sure. I'm I think people sometimes use blossom matrices to also um, account for some um, of the biological variability. But um, I'm not sure about special distance matrices. Next and maybe final question here. Do you consider clonal diversity based on VHVL pairing or only focus on VH? Yeah, so uh, this uh, of course depends on whether you use um, um, uh, bike sequencing or uh, single cell sequencing. Of course, for single cell sequencing, clonal diversity should be done on the VHVL level. I will talk more on this on uh, well on the overall topic of the HVL but um, the problem I think with the airfield in general we all like to have single cell data and the HVL or TCR alpha beta data the problem with all of us is that there are very few methods that can take into account paired data for most of the computational approaches um, that I will present so um, that's something to uh, keep in mind well, all right, we have to take one more question because she started it out saying, wonderful talk, <laughs> which I totally agree. Very well done so far. Uh, how do you expect the problem of lack of clonal overlap, oops, sorry, it just moved on me, uh, to eventually be solved in the field? Better sequencing techniques, limited limit sampling to disease tissue over uh, PBMCs or other options? Yeah, I think, as I said, um, uh, yeah, so focusing on specific um, cell subsets and um, sequ deep sequencing is, I think, a good idea. Yeah, yeah, as a very short answer for that. Yeah. Okay, well, um, to the audience, please do remember, or I'm telling you for the first time if you hopped in a little bit late, that uh, Professor Greif has agreed to answer all the questions. So not only the ones here in person, but all of the questions here uh, will be answered in a Q&A document that will be made available to you after the fact. Uh, right now, we will move into the second portion of the presentation, which will also be followed by a question period. So please do keep those questions coming. All right, Victor, I hand it back to you. 
Okay, so we are going to the next two topics, which is single cell sequencing and then the computational strategies. And I will go very briefly only on the single cell sequencing and mostly spend my time on the computational strategies. So the, as was already alluded to in the um, questions, is that um, a bike sequencing has the problem that we lose the pairing of um, BHVL or TCR um, alpha and beta sequencing. So um, that's why single cell sequencing as a whole is a very good idea. Um, so single cell sequencing preserves the pairing so that that we like so it preserves much better the biology of adaptive immune receptors since it also has been shown that binding can be abrogated if you um, combinatorially exchange um, the alpha or the light chain for example so um, so these chains are can be important for antigen binding sometimes binding is preserved sometimes binding is not preserved um, it can also um, help us to measure transcriptome, so gene activity um, plus adaptive immune receptor at the same time. So to link them together, there are some papers that have done this, but I think much more research um, uh, is um, uh, should be done in, in this regard. And um, it allows us also to be much more strict with um, uh, UMI correction since everything happens in one cell and we can be quite uh, sure of what the result can be. Although um, there are reports of um, or people have seen with single cell data that um, you can have um, two VHs and one VL, which could be biological or not. And there it's, it's a bit hard to correct. I'm also not an expert on this. Many people just um, correct these kind of data by just taking one VH and one VL or one TCR alpha, one TCR beta, just to be completely sure that they are not looking at artificial diversity. And it could also help, of course, um, to obtain more correct clonal frequency ranking, um, theoretically, because we, um, because we have paired information and we don't, um, yeah. Yeah, so I think that's that's quite clear. However, um, what we need um, overall, I think, especially for single cell sequencing, um, is to be able to pair it with antigen binding, even more so than the bike sequencing. And so this is from a blog post that we wrote, um, but uh, which illustrates quite clearly that we kind of need on the experimental side and the computational side, Kind of like a Rosetta Stone for um, immune receptor to antigen uh, binding mapping. And there have been a few approaches, uh, both from um, companies and also from academia to kind of solving experimentally the problem, because what we think I need is much better and much more high throughput and higher quality data that maps an immune receptor to its antigen or even better to its epitope, one can only dream, right? Um, and 10X has been on the forefront of that for um, from the industry point. Um, and they just recently announced in one of their, um, I guess, uh, webinars or something, it's, it's called that they will soon next year uh, provide an integrated um, high throughput um, uh, uh, solution that links antibody to antigen or B cell receptor to antigen and T cell receptor to antigen. So that will be um, very nice. But there have also been other papers which I am uh, citing here. Um, so while um, generating um, single cell data is still very, very costly and um, unfortunately, therefore, also quite high throughput, which comes again to the point of how re representative of the biology is single cell data. It sounds like a good idea, but how much do we learn from single cell data? I think the jury is a bit out there still, since the data sets are quite low dimensional and mostly focused some, um, sometimes on specific subsets of the repertoire. But 
the software is already there. So we are prepared when the huge data will come in the future. And there are several suits that I'm just um, mentioning here from Incantation to Scurpy to Immunarch and then also SC Repertoire. So, and they, they overlap to some degree, but they also have their idiosyncrasies. So um, just uh, try for yourself and they're all very good. Um, so, as I said, I'm already at the end because um, I think one can say a lot about single cell sequencing, but also, yeah, it it will not help you that much. So the main problem with single cell sequencing is that um, its throughput is very, very uh, low. So you cannot really profile entire repertoires with single cell sequencing unless you are super rich. Um, and by super rich, I mean very, very rich. Um, benchmarking of single cell sequencing, I think, is still in its infancy. Uh, keep in mind that um, this Nature Biotech benchmarking paper, this TCR paper, just came out now, and it was on bulk sequencing, showing you how far away we are from actually benchmarking single cell sequencing data. And still with bulk sequencing data, we are still, as I it should as should be also apparent by now, I can still not tell you, you have to use this or this or this for this approach. Um, there's just um, no no real standards yet. And um, what is also important to know is that most data analysis pi pipelines, so those pipelines that I'm going to talk about in the next section, are mostly developed for bike sequencing and cannot be readily used most of the time for single cell sequencing. So for example, um, just very simple germline gene usage of VHVL, how would you even represent it? So very, very simple things should be developed uh, at um, uh, much more, I think. Yeah. Um, yes, and this is just a summary that um, bike sequencing um, remains a state of the art for very deep coverage. Um, single cell sequencing preserves pairing information and it's therefore superior if you want to really go in depth for a very small portion of the repertoire. Um, yeah, and there are several approaches, uh, but uh, I think overall we need um, better insight into how reliable many of these approaches are. Okay, so now we come probably to the section which um, many of you are looking forward to the most. It's also my favorite section, so that um, uh, converges well to keep with the vocabulary of this webinar. Um, so we will go through separate sections, which is um, diversity, network analysis, and machine learning. And as before, I will go quite quickly and um, only show you brief glimpses of the um, field. And I think as with all of my slides, I apologize if I don't show um, works of some groups or some people. It's just, there's just too much and I had to make uh, some decisions. Um, but there is probably, there is much more work to be discovered um, outside of these references that I show. But they, but the, but the citations that I give you should at least help you to go further and um, cover the field. Uh, with respect to the state of the art. So enough of the blah, 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 blah. Um, this um, is uh, an overview of uh, the um, computational approaches or um, questions that you might have and for which computational approaches exist. So you might want to look into diversity and sequence similarity or um, repertoire architecture in B. Um, at clonal evolution in C, mostly for B cells, and then clonal overlap or also called convergence, which can be done both on the um, entire sequence level or as shown here on the K-mer level, on the subsequence level. What I'm not showing here um, is also um, a field that has been pushed um, by the Charlotte Dean lab is the structural diversity of entire B-cell receptor repertoires, which is on the very lower left of the slide. And there are many papers on this from the Charlotte Dean lab, which I warmly invite you to discover because it's, um, um, there are, and there's also another group of which I'm uh, lapsing on the name now, but um, there are several approaches 
just to keep it brief, that um, can infer um, the structure of the antibody from the sequence at um, quite high accuracy at very high speed so that you can look at the structural diversity of anti repercross which is very nice. <clears throat> There are many tools for all of these um, approaches, and I put here the reviews if you want to know more about these tools. And uh, we are going to through some of the principles of these um, approaches and what to look out for. Um, so one of the main things, I think, how the um, uh, field has started is uh, quantifying and comparing the diversity of um, immune repertoires, right? We have repertoire one and repertoire two, and we want to say, uh, do they have the same diversity or not? And the problem is, as we have already discussed, low clonal overlap. So it's almost like comparing apples to oranges. And how do we bring apples and oranges together into one new fruit that we can then compare across all the repertoires? Um, and this is what I'm uh, showing here now. So we have the repertoires, right? We have the antibody sequences that we can find here, for example, these four CDR3s in each repertoire, and you see that they are different. So um, you already uh, would panic, right? Uh, zero sequence overlap, what do I do? Um, and then they have different uh, frequencies. So all of this also is, of course, for T cell receptors is the same. So uh, if I don't say things explicitly, most of the things um, can be used for both BCRs and TCRs. So um, how how can we now compare the repertoires is by, by a diversity indices, which um, solve the problem by mapping frequency distributions to a common coordinate system. And one of the one, so what people usually use is the Reni entropy, or if you take the exponential of this, is the Hill diversity. And different alphas of that, so different um, parameters map to different um, diversity indices. All of you might know some of them, maybe, species richness, Shannon entropy, Simpsons index, and Berger-Parker index, for example. There are others. What this helps us that, that um, so keep this alpha in mind so we can vary this alpha. And um, if we vary this alpha and compute then the Reni entropy or Hill diversity, which is the exponential of the Reni entropy, um, then we get diversity profile. And what this allows us um, to, to do is that um, uh, it can be shown, which I'm showing briefly in the next slide, that these Hill diversity profiles kind of capture um, the um, uh, many characteristics of the underlying clonal frequency distributions that we were not able to compare because the CDR3s were different. The problem with the diversity indices that you hear that many people do not appreciate is that um, if you only look at one, you can they can be, you can be they can be qualitatively called qualitatively different conclusions depending on where you look. So for example, for alpha equals one, which is the Shannon entropy, uh, you would say that the blue repertoire is more diverse than the red repertoire, whereas for alpha equals two, the red repertoire would be more diverse than the blue repertoire. So completely different biological conclusions you would draw if you had just looked only at the Shannon entropy or at the Simpsons index. That's why it's good to check a few indices or look at the profile to see if there's some overlap um, or some intersection between the samples or not. Then, the, unfortunately, the problem is how do we, and so this Reni entropy or Hill diversity gives us um, a number, but what does it actually mean? <clears throat> so there is a very nice interpretation of that. So for example, here we have a repertoire X of five sequences, which have <clears throat> a given frequency distribution. And the um, um, and for alpha equals one, which is the experiment, the, the exponential of the Shannon entropy, uh, we would get um, 2.28. So what does 2.28 means? It means that if we round down, it's kind of two, and this would mean that the diversity of repertoire X is equivalent to a repertoire composed of two clones with equal frequency. <clears throat> 
So for example, if we had the repertoire X um, where one clone would be 99% and the others very little, then um, the diversity of this repertoire would probably be close to one because even if you have a thousand clones, if one is super highly represented, the diversity is equivalent to just having one clone. So those diversity, those diversity indices create equivalence classes, uh, which is for the nerds um, among you, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, and here we show um, in this genome medicine paper that um, clonal frequency distributions here simulated as SIF distributions recap uh, can be recapitulated by diversity profiles, so, um, which is very nice. Um, the problem with diversity is that um, since you're undersampling, there is a problem of how true the diversity or how true the um, a, a calculated diversity is. Is it a representation? representation of your entire diversity and for that you can use estimators. I'm just showing you a few here. I will not go into detail. This would be an entire lecture on its own. All I can say is that I think also here the field is underdeveloped and would um, and it would be nice to see some more um, papers on that to really benchmark different estimators um, given given also current sequencing depth and clonal diversities. But that should get you started, uh, some of these um, citations here. <clears throat> so um, if we look at um, the clonal um, uh, convergence, as I said, we can look either on the entire sequence level or on the subsequence level, which I showed there as the black letters, so this DG and this GG. Um, and yes, and there is a very nice review from Castro et al. on uh, public um, receptors also. So um, uh, clonal overlap can be um, by incorporating um, no frequency. So you just look at the sequence and not how often you find the sequence in your repertoire. This is on the left. And then you can, there's for example, the Maurice de Horn and versions of that, uh, which includes also the uh, frequency of your um, sequence. So it weights, um, your overlap by how often a given uh, um, uh, clone is found in your repertoire. And there are many other approaches that marry these kind of concepts together, and I'm showing you um, uh, these uh, citations there. I can, if you go to the lower right, the Rampala et al. Journal of Mathematical Biology is one of is a very excellent paper, which gives a lot of overview of these different um, overlap and diversity estimators. Um, one, I think, defining um, concept in immune receptor repertoires is the um, concept of uh, generation probability. So what is generation probability? So we all know that um, if you look at your uh, sequencing data, um, different V-genes are used in different frequencies. So that means um, uh, it's uh, the probability of seeing a given V-gene um, um, is different across V-genes. And therefore also the probability of seeing certain CDR3s is different um, across CDR3s. If they are um, short, they have a higher generation probability. If they are longer, they have a longer, uh, they have a um, lower generation probability. And all of this can be mathematically modeled uh, by a program that is used, IGOR, which is for the nucleotide sequences. And there is a um, um, corresponding uh, program, which is called OLGA, which is for amino acid sequences. And there is also, so, if you just go to these um, citations that I put on the lower right, you will see also that um, these frameworks can also include selection, for example. Um, what is nice with IGO is that um, uh, once you have trained um, on your data, you can assign a generation probability to your sequence, which means you can see whether how likely it was um, that a certain sequence could have been generated 
or is to be generated, which can also then help you understand whether the public clones that you see, is it because they are very easy to generate or is it because um, they have been elicited by an antigen response? Um, and though would be a priori unlikely, but this antigen response um, makes them more likely to appear, which could be used for flagging sequences as antigen associated or even antigen specific, which has also been, which this whole um, framework has also been used for. Yes, so this is Igor. Um, and um, this framework um, of looking at generation probabilities has also been uh, used for looking at the expected number of public sequences per repertoire in mice and human. And I think also um, in this paper, we have also, I think, TCRs and BCRs, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, and it can also be used as a classifier for uh, predicting whether for a given number of um, a people, a given sequence will be public, so shared among a, a given number of people or not. So that's very nice. I think an open question here is, um, um, do um, repertoire generation models differ across individuals? And what is the influence of technology on these models? I think there is a bit more work that we could do um, on these kind of questions. <clears throat> From the diversity point of view, they have, they have there have also been approaches that have exploited sequence convergence on the subsequence level for predicting antibody antigen um, TCR epitope binding. So these were two nature papers from 2017 from um, Dash et al. and Glanville et al. And the Glanville et al. paper has now been recently updated with um, uh, a new uh, with Glyph 2.0 by Huang et al. in Nature Biotech in 2020. Both of these um, approaches either take into account sequence similarity or uh, KMER-based similarity to predict um, epitope binding. What was interesting in these papers was for me personally not that um, very similar sequences could target the same epitope, but that also very different sequences could target the same epitope. And to find those sequences, um, I think we require completely new methods uh, to find these outliers, um, which uh, are very interesting to also predict, I guess, in the future. <clears throat> so as a summary, um, I guess diversity is one of the hallmark features of adaptive immune repertoires. Um, and uh, it can be quantified using methods from mathematical ecology because um, uh, all this Reni entropy stuff has all been done before, counting tigers and dolphins and whatnot. Diversity profiles are superior to single diversity um, indices when comparing clonal frequency distributions. Um, diversity can hold also immune information. I didn't show you that, but it can be used to classify um, repertoires uh, based on um, disease state. VDJ recombination statistics can be inferred mathematically and then used to assign generation probabilities to then judge whether public clones are, um, um, uh, um, are likely to occur or not likely to occur. So the level of surprise that I should have when seeing a public clone. And um, yeah, and repertoire overlap may be quantified uh, from different perspectives, a frequency, independent, dependent, and so on. Okay, so the complementary part to diversity is sequence similarity. So because we want to know within a repertoire, how similar are those sequences? And for that, people usually use network analysis and um, uh, to resolve the sequence similarity architecture, as we'd like to say. And I will just point you to one paper, a preprint uh, by Rami Arnaud, where they looked at uh, both sequence similarity and frequency together. Here we will only look at the sequence, not at the frequency of those sequences, most of the time. Um, so 
uh, how does this work? So you have to build a distance matrix, which can be computationally very expensive. And then you have a distance matrix from which you then build the network and the network can then be represented with edges and node. The node is the CDR3 and, the, and you draw an edge based on the distance that um, uh, you want. So for example, Levenshtein distance one would probably all only connect those ones that have um, similar specificity, for example, if that's your research question. Yes. Um, and um, what we have seen and what other people have seen, um, research groups have seen as well, that uh, is that um, if you undergoing an immune response, the sequence similarity architecture of your network looks more like a power law, looks more power law distributed. So you have few nodes to which you have a lot of connections, whereas um, the uh, Poisson or exponential architecture is mostly seen for naive repertoires. And that can be looked at using the degree distributions and the degree distributions of a network is, um, so the, the degree of a node is the number of connections a given node has. And then you can just count how many times you have CDSVs with a given um, degree. This is, may sound very um, uh, complicated, but it's not. And I put also um, the papers, I think, yeah, just go to the MIHO nature communications paper and this will explain things quite clear, clearly, I think. Um, Yes, and then the public clones have been for T cells, for example, also linked to um, uh, uh, to antigen, so uh, to um, antigen binding, as uh, was shown by Madi et al. in genome research. So there you see that um, sequences with common antigen binding clustered together. And just as a, if I go back here, do I have that? Oh, yes, here. Um, we also uh, showed that actually public clones are very important for the um, for your um, network uh, to, to to keep the architecture of your network intact. If you delete a certain number of public clones from your network, it will completely disintegrate into different clusters and will not have the shape anymore. So, for example, the um, uh, exponential shape or whatever. So, um, showing so showing that public clones are usually more connected than non-public clones, which could be due to generation probability. Um, so there you see that generation probability and sequence similarity uh, could go hand in hand. And this is what was also um, exploited by the Balchak lab where they used um, sequence similarity and um, then looked at whether uh, given uh, neighbors of a given node were more or less likely to occur by chance using then um, generation probability approaches. Again, trying to find over-represented um, clusters or sequences um, that uh, could point to um, antigen binding. Yes, so that was all about network architecture, um, which um, can be used to determine antigen recognition breadth. If you, for example, link um, all the sequences that um, differ by one amino acid. So uh, this is also something I didn't say. Most of the networks or all of the networks are based on um, probably amino acid uh, sequence, since you really want to look at antigen binding. That is not to say that you could also do it, of course, with nucleotide sequences. Um, yes, and then as as a few as of a few years ago, many people only looked at network shape just by eye, but I think we need much more quantitative approaches, such as, for example, looking at the degree distributions and different network um, um, uh, measures to compare um, samples across disease states, for example. Um, construction of large-scale networks requires still high-performance computing. There are, there are a few um, approaches now um, out, which I should have cited here, but uh, I did not. So, for example, um, 
der, uh, for example, there's this uh, CLAST TCR uh, preprint, which can build very large uh, distance matrices um, in a very clever way uh, by not being so computationally demanding, for example. <clears throat> um, yes, and public clones play a special role um, in antibody and T-cell networks, uh, which um, I think we have not fully understood yet. Then coming to phylogenetics, which I have to say I'm not an expert um, on, so I will go quite quickly. But uh, the main um, the main um, uh, uh, purpose of phylogenetics is uh, to infer the evolutionary relationships um, from naive B cell to the to the plasma cell, so, so the um, affinity based evolution over time. And for example, to reconstruct the evolution of broadly neutralizing antibodies could be one application. Um, there are many different approaches that you can use, which are on the left. I will not go into detail. It's, it's explained. And there are also overview articles for that. Um, what one should be careful as well about, because many people just use one approach and then they're happy. Uh, we have shown using simulations um, that phylogenetic approaches may lead to different tree topologies depending on the approaches you choose. Mm -hmm. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and as of recently, also trees have mostly um, disregarded frequency information of the clonal sequence for building the tree. And but this has also been addressed, at least to some extent, by the Matson lab in 2018 by the paper that I'm showing on the lower right. Um, recent um, advances in phylogenetic analysis um, have been to also predict um, affinity using phylogenetic approaches, again, by the Matson lab on the uh, left-hand side in plus computational biology. And then the Kleinstein lab, um, and this is an effort led by Ken Hearn. Um, so one of the main approaches or one of the main questions that you have when you look at your tree and you know um, um, that you have different cell types in your data set. So for example, naive B cells, germinal center, memory, plasma, you, you want to see how they stack up in the tree when um, a state switches happen. And here um, uh, it was, uh, an approach was developed that can actually statistically characterize um, migration, differentiation, and isotype switching along B cell phylogenetic trees to give like, um, like um, uh, so that you can say whether some phenomena that you see in this tree are significant or not. So for example, then you can see how often do I see that the memory B cell comes from a germinal center B cell. Is this significant or not? Um, so this is what this package does. It's, it's called Dowser and um, it's on Bitbucket and uh, there's also tutorials for that. And there's a preprint also. <clears throat> So, um, as a summary again, there exist many methods for phylogenetic inference, but one should be careful because they can lead to different um, outcome. I think this is not sought right now, and um, there's also no standardized way of approaching this. But again, I'm not an expert. It might be best to contact these authors that I have just um, mentioned. <clears throat> yes. So we will go forward to the last topic, which is machine learning. So machine learning is very, very hot right now, not only in uh, immune receptor analysis, but overall, as you know, from all the high profile papers, but especially for immune receptors, I think machine learning is really useful um, to kind of mine the many sequence dependencies that we cannot see by our um, other computational approaches that machine learning can just learn and um, uh, see um, by itself. So there is just to remind ourselves, uh, supervised machine learning where you give both the data and also labels of the data. And there is unsupervised machine learning uh, where you only provide the data, but you don't provide the labels. And then there can be shallow, um, shallow learning. So for example, support vector machines, uh, random forest, and then there are also deep neural networks, which um, can learn abstract feature representations from the data through a, through a hierarchical structure. So many, many layers. 
if you know more if you want to know more about these things there i put a review there and there are many other reviews i will not uh, say more about machine learning specific i will more um explain what one should be careful about when when using machine learning for immune receptor repertoire so the main uh, and this is from a review that i invite you all to read that we just wrote with um, Lindsay Cowell and Goyari on machine learning in immune receptor data so if we go to panel c the main machine learning tasks are sequence based Based classification. So you want to, um, for a given sequence, you want to predict a label, for example, binding to antigen X or Y. And um, repertoire-based uh, classification, where you want to predict the label of um, a repertoire. So for example, autoimmune, like diabetes, yes or no. And there is also a generative model where based on um, a training, uh, based on some kind of uh, input data, you want to generate new um, new data, um, new sequences that have some kind of, that share some kind of property with the input data. So for example, antigen binding that you, for discovery of new antibodies. <clears throat> and um, I think, the, yeah, so so maybe we go to E, so to panel E. So um, for machine learning, you always have to encode your data in a certain way. Um, and some of these factors, so you could encode via KMERS, you could encode via Ashley or Kedera factors, which are physical chemical representations of amino acids. Um, you can use also, as we did previously, um, you can also use clonal diversity. Um, for machine learning, many, many things you can use. This is though quite similar to normal machine learning, so I will not go into detail. I think this is the more interesting uh, slide where we kind of detailed um, the um, many things that make machine learning on adaptive immune receptor repertoires or sequences especially hard. So one thing is the low clonal overlap or even a low subsequence overlap across individuals. For one individual, we can have, um, so now we're at the B, um, we can have multiple immune states, of course, or, uh, or for if we are on the sequence level also, we have poly reactivity, right? So how do we how do we even generate the data to have these kind of information? But even if we had this information, how would we um, how would we cope with this in a machine learning framework? Especially since we know that um, the disease signal can be quite low. So, for example, for for celiac disease, celiac patients have uh, one um, one uh, cell out of one million can be associated with celiac disease, for example. So the signal can be very, very low. And even, for example, if in the in the famous um, CMV data set from 2017, only a couple of hundred TCRs were actually associated out of millions with CMV. So the signal is generally very, very low. And, the, and you can imagine if you want to find the signal for many immune states, uh, it can get very tough. The, so the, and then we go to D, so the diversity of the, Immune signal is also broad. It can be in the frequency space, so clonal expansion. It can be in the sequence space. It can be also in the 3D structural space with um, sequence dependencies. There can be confounding factors, uh, which we will briefly discuss, such as age or sex or MHC. And then there are also technological effects that can influence machine learning, of course. And for most of these things, we do not have a real way of dealing with them yet, just as a broad stroke. So to not get your hopes up too much. Um, here I'm just summarizing a few of the major machine learning works that have been published over the last years. Um, there has, so, so there has been prediction of immune state, prediction of antigen binding, and generative modeling for making new sequences. and um, we think uh, to benchmark machine learning in the future and currently also um, ground through sequence data generations, such as, for example, using IAGO, OLGA, or ImmuneSim, 
um, is very important since most of the time the correct experiment da experimental data to benchmark your machine learning approach is not available. This is just um, very brief that there's this very nice Sokolova uh, 2009 paper where, uh, where um, it summarized um, uh, how to um, how to quantify um, accuracy for machine learning if you have multiple classes. So for example, multiple immune states or multiple antigen antigens. Um, and so there's macro diver, um, macro accuracies and micro accuracies. I will not go into more detail, but it's um, it's good to look into them, especially if your data is unbalanced. As I said, um, briefly touch upon these are just a few papers where people have shown that um, MHC um, age or sex can influence your data. Um, and that, of course, should be taken theoretically into account when you do machine learning. Um, but it's very tough because um, you either need to stratify your data or using some other wizardry. So it gets very tough. Again, we are at this problem that now we don't have the um, over sequencing problem. We have the not enough samples problem um, here. As I said, um, um, in order to be, so whenever I talk to people and many people just tell me, yeah, we just need uh, good data and then we can solve everything using machine learning. That's not really true because even if I gave people um, huge amounts of data with all immune states and antigen binding, very, very few would have ready um, a machine learning framework for a specific research question. That's why I think it's really important to have good um, simulation suits where you can um, develop machine learning frameworks now. So when in the future, in I don't know, five years, um, the really good data comes, we are actually prepared and we don't have to start only then with developing new machine learning approaches or um, machine learning approaches that are um, adapted to the research question. <clears throat> Yes, and to also, this is just a quick shout out, we um, pre we just put out a uh, machine learning platform which helps to standardize your machine learning approaches, which is called ImmuneML. And <clears throat> I will not go into detail. You can see the preprint. Um, it basically allows you to um, <clears throat> input any kind of data as long as it's kind of air compliant. Um, simulate data, use different representations for your data, use different methods, and to do this in a very reproducible way that is also then shareable across groups. And there's also a graphical um, user interface, uh, but also a command line for the uh, more experts. And it can be deployed on Google Cloud, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So please read that if you haven't already. Um, uh, what I think is really important in machine learning is to um, perform suitable um, uh, tests. So you should always test via label shuffling whether um, your class definition is actually appropriate. So you just shuffle the labels and then, and then the prediction accuracy should decrease and converge towards the theoretical limit which is 50-50 for binary, and then for multi-class, it can be different, depending also on your um, uh, balancing of your data. Randomizing sequences is also always nice to just check for any effects that you might have. Um, equilibration of data sets is quite a good idea. Sometimes or many times it's not possible. Um, testing the effect of undersampling on the classifier is interesting. So we did this, for example, in the ImmuneML preprint. Um, uh, evaluate feature recovery, um, which you can you, do with simulated data because there you know the signal. So you can see how well a given machine learning approach actually infers those sequences or motifs that should be disease or, or um, antigen specific. And then, um, if possible, stratify your data uh, by, you know, age group, HLA, uh, sex, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you know that this is a huge um, 
factor for your research question. <clears throat> so to summarize, uh, machine learning uh, is useful for classifying, predicting, and generating immune repertoires. Um, I guess I haven't talked too much about the generation part, but um, this has mostly been used for antibodies and, um, uh, for example, Ami Meur and colleagues uh, have shown, so I'm citing the preprint on the previous slide, have shown that um, you can generate new antibody sequences, for example, um, based on um, certain developability criteria. And also Friedenson and I have shown that they can generate new antigen binding sequences based on an appropriate um, training data set. So machine learning can act on, depending on the, the um, encoding on entire sequences or subsequences. Um, we can measure the accuracy of machine learning, but it remains a challenge, and especially I think standardization, reproducibility, and yeah, and so forth remain challenges so far. Um, I think what uh, it's also a challenge to really um, extract the important features because we don't only want a high accuracy, we only want to, we also want to understand what drives the immune response. And for that, we need to know the underlying features that drive accuracy and that remains a challenge as well. But that's a machine learning problem. And adjusting for confounders and, um, uh, and so forth is also still an issue. And I think it, it almost also is a question of what is a good training test and training data. Um, and uh, I think this is still very much an open question, especially for antigen binding. Um, is a good negative data set where sequences are very close but not binding or very far and not binding? All of these kind of questions, I think, are still out there. Future directions. Um, so I just put some papers here which have a future direction boxes so you can read them through on your own time. But uh, my personal view is that I think we need better standardization of experimental protocols so we can actually compare studies across um, or data sets across studies. Um, uh, we need large scale antigen annotated data and also disease annotated data. Uh, I think, um, especially for B cell receptors, sequence and structural modeling um, should go together. Uh, we need a better proteomic understanding of, and of the antibody repertoire. I only touched briefly on this. We need better computational methods for analyzing pair chain data. We need to better be able to interpret uh, machine learning and to better understand biology through machine learning. And um, we need to better understand also the structure of the antigen specific motifs that are implicated in antigen binding and immune status. And with that, I would like to thank uh, our many collaborators and my group members that have shaped over the years um, these slides. And thank you very much for your attention. And I think we are open for questions again. Excellent. Well, you have uh, lots and lots of questions. <laughs> uh, again, to the attendees, we will start at the bottom and work our way up and all of these questions. But if we do not get to yours, do not despair. Uh, you will get an answer to your question. It will just be a little bit after the fact. Yes. Oh, so let's start with the first one here. Could you comment on long read sequencing technologies for BCR? Are they advanced enough to cover the repertoire accurately? That you, this is kind of a blind side uh, on my part. I think people have used uh, um, long read sequencing. Um, I think, uh, I think you still have an issue there with um, covering um, uh, the entire diversity. But I would have to. So this is something that I will research more and then put in the written answer. I would say, yeah. Okay. Next question. Does a high Libra sequencing score mean higher affinity to that antibody? Whew. Um, I'm not so sure. I think a high score means um, uh, you have 
more reads for that score, but I'm also not sure. I would I, I would also have to look that up. I'm not uh, I I'm not that deep into the Libra Seek technology. Sorry. Yeah. Oof, so many detailed questions. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. You get a little chance to uh, mm. do a little research before you answer yeah. some of these questions yeah. in writing. Yeah. Uh, next question, I'll put you on the spot yet again. What is the antibody frequency and how is it computed in a repertoire? Yeah. So uh, maybe I didn't um, say this clearly enough, that's true. So what I mean with uh, frequency is always the number of reads that map to a certain uh, sequence. So that's what I mean with frequency. And then of course you give an absolute number and then you can compute the frequency of that. So it's just the number of reads that map to a certain sequence. That's what I mean with, with frequency. That was not clear. Sorry. Yeah. We have actually two questions, so I'll combine them. And they're both on visualizing the repertoire. The first was a more general question. What are some good ways to visualize the repertoire? Second question was a little more specific. What is your favorite way, specifically of visualizing TCR uh, repertoire uh, networks? Mm. So, uh, so the first question: What are some good ways to visualize repertoires? Um, I think um, it de really depends on the research question. So uh, that's why I showed this review where you can either look at you know clonal uh, diversity or clonal expansion or sequence similarity, and for all of these things, different approaches are the best. So, for example, for sequence similarity, network is the best for. Uh, clonal diversity, these um, diversity indices are the best. So it really depends on the research question. Uh, but the the um, images that I showed here are kind of good examples of how one should show the data. So that could maybe be a, be a guideline. For the network question, what are the favorite way of showing networks? Is um, That's a good question. So as I said, so if you have uh, small numbers of clones, you can show the network um, uh, nicely as a as a picture, um, but as you have like ten thousand clones, for example, then it's better to just look at the clonal uh, at the degree uh, distribution, for example. That said, there are um, there's a Python package Network X, and there's also an R package iGraph, which can make networks, um, and these make nice. Um, these make uh, nice graphs. I think there is an, there is another on which I'm blanking also now, which um, I will also come back to you. Uh, there's a there's a um, better way of showing networks in a nicer way, but I will put this also into the written question. Yeah, I'm blanking on the name now. Yeah. Next question: Is there a software pipeline for the processing of amplicon se sequencing data yeah. from raw data to table of counts? Yeah, yeah. So, so for example, my XCR is used by many, many people. So, yes. So you just put in the raw data, and you get the table of counts. Yeah, and it's just a few lines. It's very easy. Yeah. Next question: Would you recommend the Best go-to resource for single-cell TCR analysis, especially in combination with transcriptome analysis, for beginners. I think <laughs> there are not so many. There are only a few papers, um, and I don't even know the specific papers now, so I would have to look that up. But this field is its in, in its infancy, so there are not many approaches to that, and certainly not many packages um that uh that can do a lot in this regard i think um Skirpy does that to some degree but again i would have to look that up i would have to look that up yeah but there, but it uh, for sure there is i think no tutorials for beginners i think yeah yeah okay good to know i'll avoid that then <laughs> 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 is there a known mechanism explaining why some air degree distributions generate power laws, maybe somatic hypermutation, or perhaps even sequencing errors? Why well, some air degree distribution? Uh, yeah. So um, I think, yes. So I think somatic hypermutation for um, uh, somatic hypermutation for B cell receptors is one. Uh, way of looking at it for the overall distribution um 
where you can have also some kind of power law. It depends on how you define power law. It's also based on the generation probability that some sequences are just more um, easier to generate and some are much harder. And this is also on a power law. So uh, th all of these things are connected to some degree. Yeah. Next question. In human studies, we do not usually have a high N to really use sex as a variable. Would you comment on how to adjust for sex differences? Is there a set of sex-related genes used in TCR analysis, for example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, then you're out of luck. We do not know a lot about this. Um, and, and remember that the sex bias is also MHC-related, so it's like a three-way uh, thing. Um, uh, yes, but I think this is touching on a good point that in actually to make really good biological conclusions for humans, we need high N. So I see many studies that have low N. They are nice, but the biological conclusiveness is a bit, yeah, too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next question. Is there scope for moving forward with the, with with this kind of computational learning to the structural 3D level? Yeah. So, um, uh, so, so the machine learning field in general has many approaches for 3D structural learning. I think for now, if we look, that's probably what the um, uh, what the person means here is that if we want to look at the repertoire and use um, Structure also, I think nobody has done that yet. I think to using structural information from entire repertoires for classifying um, repertoires, I think nobody's done it. But on the sequence level, uh, this is quite common, uh, commonly used by people, just also for protein-protein interaction. There are many approaches to that. Yeah. Next question. Uh, regarding antibody antigen prediction in that area, can uh, can some kind of metadata be used with a motif vocabulary vocabulary to improve antibody antigen prediction? Regarding to the antibody, can some kind of metadata be used? Um, metadata. I'm not sure what is meant here, um, but I think for antibody antigen binding prediction in general, we just need much larger data sets. I think metadata, I'm not sure what it could be, but um, for example, for 3D structural data, we only have, I think, a thousand non-redundant antibody antigen crystal structures. We need many, many more to really understand antibody antigen binding. So better it's to have um, much more uh, data. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. Is the almost exclusive focus on CDR3s due to short read lengths problematic for network analysis and ML approaches? So that's a good question. And um, so the, the focus why we mostly focus on the CDR3 is because there's not so much um, information in the germline genes unless you look at somatic hypermutation, but most of the time, most of the diversity is concentrated in the CDR3, and it's the most important for any kind of prediction. Most of the time, if you look at the germline gene side, so the non-CDR3 side, it doesn't give you so much variation across different disease states or antibody antigen binding. And we have recently also shown that, again, if you look at structural data, the CDR3 is the only obligate so the CDRH3 is the only obligate region for antibody. Antigen binding, all other regions could have for some structures have been dropped out, have been not been useful. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, we are running short of time, but we'll try to get a couple more in here. What about using deep learning techniques? Yes, there are a lot of deep, so deep learning has been used. So just go to the overview slide that I have with the, with the, with papers that um, have used machine learning and there you will find some deep learning approaches, yeah. Okay, last question. Can we use immune ML platform to implement some immune-based solution to a non-immune data set? Um, yeah. I would not, that would be great, <laughs> but I think immunomel is very immune receptor specific. Uh, so um, I think there are better 
pipelines for non-immune receptor data. Yeah, as a short answer. All right. Well, um, to remind the audience, you will be getting questions to all of these answers. Uh, we need to wrap things up. So in concluding, I would like to thank Professor Greif for relating his insights and experience with data processing and analysis of adaptive immune receptor repertoires. I also thank you very much for joining the webcast today. An on-demand version will be available in a couple of days. I'll send a link by email to everybody who registered and I'll also send a link to the Q&A document when it's ready. Feel free to watch this or any of our on-demand webinars when it's convenient. Thanks again, and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.